All right. Today I want to read to you the story. Before we get into our allegory this morning, I want to read to you the story of the triumphal entry. And we can find that in Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, verse 29. Mine's got eight, but it's okay. And uh, this story, like I said, is often one that, you know, we, we, it's on the calendar, Palm Sunday, you know. Uh, it's, it's one of those Sundays that we kind of kind of move over pretty quickly. Uh, there's no egg hunt on Palm Sunday. There's no presents under the tree on Palm Sunday. You know, people sometimes bring to their churches, they bring little palm fronds, and we really, we hold them, we really don't know what to do with them. Some people make them into crosses, which is a whole week later. I don't quite get that. But, uh, I mean, we just, I mean, it, it's just one of those holidays that's just sitting out there. Well, today, I hope that through the reading of this, and then the allegory that is told, between the time that Jesus comes into Jerusalem and he is crucified, the allegory we're going to study today is given in that time period. Okay? So let's just read it. It says this. And when he had said to these, these things, he went ahead and going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany, at the moment, excuse me, on the mount called Olive, he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village in front of you, where, an entering, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which one has yet, never yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you are untying it, you shall say that to them, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And they were untying the colt. Its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? Logical question. That's not yours. <laughs> okay? You know what? It's called theft. All right? It's a normal question. Why are you untying my colt? All right? Um, and they said, the Lord has need of it. And then they brought it to Jesus. There's no indication that the guy was like, no, you can't do that. You know, Peter didn't take out his one sword and do business. He, you know, they just let it go. The one sword in the whole group, right? Uh, he just let it go. And, he, uh, and they, uh, they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they, said to, uh, they sat Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road, and as he was drawing near, already on the way down to the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples being, uh, began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, and this is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. I tell you, if they were silent, the very stones would cry out. Now Jesus goes into the city a little bit farther. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you, because you did not know the time of your visitation. You didn't know who your king was. And Jesus made this prophecy, and it happens word for word. The Romans came in, barricaded the city, sieged the city. They tore down everything, burned everything. There are stories, grisly stories, of, of the murder and the warfare that went on in that city. And interestingly enough, the prophecy is fulfilled not necessarily through the Romans, 
The Romans barricaded the city. But what happened is that the people tore each other apart in the city. They killed each other. Crazy stuff. Because they couldn't recognize their king. All right, Noah, show that allegory. Let me tell you a story. There was a time when Jesus was in the temple speaking to religious leaders. And he told them this story. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He built a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and he built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and he went away on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another one, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them more than the first time and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw his son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him, threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those workers to a wretched end, they replied. And then he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. And Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a people that will produce its fruit. Remember that a man, a wealthy landowner, a man built a vineyard. Secondly, he wanted fruit from that vineyard. Those are the two things we're going to focus on today. The vineyard and the fruit. Everything revolves around these two things in this story. Now, there's a lot of stuff in there about, you know, servants killing people, and they sent the son, and you, you can get the correlations of Easter and the whole thing. You get that? But the, the concept is this. It's all about the vineyard, and it's all about the fruit. Without those two constructs, this whole thing falls apart. Without a vineyard, there's no story. Without, a, without the, 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 the process of trying to get the fruit from that vineyard, there's no story. Everything else is reliant on those two things, okay? So, um, when we think about this vineyard, we have to think about whose vineyard it is, right? Matthew 21, 33 says this, There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went on to another country. When, therefore, verse 40, the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? That question, that question is all about how they managed that vineyard. The answer to the end of the question, that, that's, that's a bunch of, there's a bunch of passages between that. I just read out of verse 33 and 40. See the distance between that? But the concept is this. How will he treat them when he returns? That all depends on how they manage his vineyard. What these tenants had was not theirs. They didn't own it, yet they treated it like it was theirs. They possessed it as if they had a right to it in and of themselves. When they had no right to it at all. They were living off the blessing of the landowner. Yet they possessed it and they held it and they wouldn't allow the fruit that was being produced to get outside the walls. 
They put a watch, the watchtower was not used to welcome the king. It was used to defend against the king. Defend against the landowner. Defend against his agents. You see, the watchtower was built so that they could see the king coming, the, the landowner coming. Here he comes. Get everything ready quick. Get everything ready. He's coming. Make it right. Make it beautiful. Get the fruit ready. Here he comes. Instead, they looked out and they saw that it was not theirs, and they defended against the true owner. Now, this is a parable spoken at a particular audience. It says that the Pharisees realized that Jesus was talking about them. But more so, he was talking about Israel. He was talking about the people of Israel. Let me, let me, let me go there for a second. It says um, in Isaiah 43, 1, it says, But now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. You are mine. Yesterday in the, uh, one of the sessions, it talked about, uh, guys, you got to get a hold of them in these uh, audio versions of these sessions. They were awesome. Um, talked about how God made Adam and he put him in a garden and he gave him a job to do. But Adam didn't own the garden. He didn't have, he didn't have ownership. He had dominion over it. There's a difference. There's a difference. We've been called to a task. Israel was called to a task. You know what Israel's job was? To be a light to the nations. They were supposed to be a light to the nations. This thing, I'm sorry I'm playing with this. It keeps falling off. I haven't used it in like three weeks. All right, there we go. To be a light to the nations. They were supposed to be an example. They were supposed to show the world what it's like to be a chosen one of God. And Jesus tells a story like this, which says, listen, I gave it to you. I gave you everything that you needed. I, I provided the promise. I brought you out of Egypt. I gave you a vineyard that was flowing with milk and honey. And all I wanted you to do was honor me with it. You could have, the, you could have everything. I just wanted you to honor me with it. But every time I tried to get your attention, you killed my, my voice. My prophets, you stone those. Eh, we'll, just, we'll get into that in a second. All right? So the vineyard, you have to understand the vineyard is not ours. God has given us amazing things. He's blessed you. I'm sitting, you're, you're like, well, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not as blessed as that guy. Then you're missing the point, man. If you're, if you're judging yourself against somebody else, you're missing the point. The plain fact that you were born free here in America, or you came to America, and you're here now, is a blessing. Hopefully that will be the same way for generations to come. That's what I pray for. You're here this morning, and there's not a Gestapo out the door ready to burn the place down. You're blessed. You have a Bible. You know how many generations of, 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 of the world wish they could have the Scriptures in their own language? Listen, you can go to the dollar store and get a Bible. There's free ones in the foyer. Take one. I'm serious. You, come on, folks. Don't, just because you don't have enough mo as much money as the guy next to you does not mean you are not blessed. you got to get out of your head. You're blessed. But that blessing is as much your own doing as you taking your next breath. You can't make yourself take the next breath. If it doesn't come, it doesn't come. That would be weird if it happened like a mass here. We, you know, we'll probably get written up for some kind of cult work. But, I mean, the idea is your breath is not your own. That next heartbeat, make it beat. Go ahead, do it. Do it. It just does. Life is a gift. Blessings are a gift. We are, we are stewards of the blessings of God. We don't own them. We can't treat them like we own. If God calls us to give a portion of it back, 
We got to give it. We have to die. This was talked about yesterday too. I, t- I told, I leaned over to, to Pete and I said, man, these seminars are like exactly what I'm talking about on Sunday. I mean, you're going to think I just stole it. But uh, the idea is this. You got to die to what the world says you need. You've got to die to what the world says is success. One of the quotes that came out that I, of yesterday that I love was, you're not created for success. What? You're not created for success. You're created for faithfulness. You're not created for success. You're created for faithfulness. Let God be the judge of how successful you are, not your neighbor. Not the Joneses. The poor Joneses. They get a bad rap. I don't know. I don't know how they got the bad rap, but they must have a really nice house. I just said, they got all the toys, those Joneses. Um, So let's move on. Let's move on to the fruit. Okay? The vineyard and the fruit. Matthew 21, 34 says, When the season for the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to uh, to the tenants to get his fruit. There's no point in having a vineyard without fruit. It's just called land, a big old field, okay? Without the fruit, it's, it's a pointless endeavor. You get where I'm going with that? Without the fruit, are we living pointless existences? Ouch. Ouch. Verse 43 says, therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to people producing its fruit. See how important the fruit is? Okay, I'm going to read to you what the fruit of Israel was supposed to be. We're we're going to go, we're we're jumping around today, I know, but I'm going to give you a second. Go to Isaiah chapter 58. I'm going to give you a second, get there. Isaiah, that's in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 58. And uh, I'm going to read to you, and I want you to read along with me, the fruit of Israel. This is a long section, 6 through 12. But I want you to read it, and I don't want you to just, we're, we're not sitting here today go, going like tapping our foot. Israel, you, no. Remember, Israel is God, our, our are, is, our God's chosen people, all right? But the purpose for, purpose for which they were put into existence, they abdicated that role, and Jesus gave it to somebody else. That doesn't mean they're not ch- God's chosen people anymore. It just says, listen, if you're not going to bear the fruit, then I'm going to have to work through something else. And I want you to take this as a lesson for us today. If we are pointless in the vineyard that God has given us, he's going to get somebody else that's going to bear fruit. If the church is pointless in the goals and purposes for which God gave it, and they happen to be the same goals and purposes for which he gave Israel, I'm going to read it in a second, then don't be Shocked when the king gives a vineyard to somebody else. And I think we're sitting at the cusp of that in our church culture these days. We are becoming irrelevant. Now, now that's a funny word. Because we want to become, we want to be relevant, right? We want to be so relevant. We got to have you know, all this cool stuff. Now, I'm not against the cool stuff. I like computers. I like, I've been really frustrated with computers lately. But I like, you know, I like uh, having a nice background to show you the verses. I like, you know, green lights on the wall. I like that stuff. That's fun. But that can't be church. Okay? Because relevance has got to be more than just entertainment value. Okay? Relevance, if, 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 if that's all it is, then we are pointless. We're not bearing fruit, and the kingdom is going to go to somebody who will. Okay, so we have to look at what God wants his vineyard to produce, his fruit to be. So here we go. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 6. Is not the fast, 
uh, is not the fast that I've chosen. He talked about fasts. Uh, they, were, they were fasting. They were doing all the stuff. They were putting green lights on the wall. You know, they, they were doing all the stuff, but they, but they were becoming irrelevant. Here we go. To loose the bonds of wickedness. To undo the strip, uh, straps of the yoke. To let the oppressed go free. And to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover him and to not hide yourself from your own flesh. Don't hide. Don't use the walls of the vineyard to keep people out. Don't sit a, a watch in the wall so that we can defend it. Then you shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteous, righteousness shall be before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. Folks, I've said it, I've said it, I've said it probably a hundred times, if not more, in the few years that I've been here. The church will not impact the culture unless we are reformed. Reformation comes before revival. Sorry, it's got to start here. So people pray, can pray for revival all day long. You know where revival is going to come from? Not from us. God is going to raise up somebody else to bring revival unless we are broken, unless we are reformed, unless we get in our face, we confess our pride, we confess our construct of what church is supposed to be and we say god this is your church this is your vineyard i want to bear fruit bring me the people that i can do your work through because i'm telling you it, revival is not going to come it's not going to come I, and you, I know i know i know you know i will amend that statement for, for once and for all it's not going to come through this church if we are not broken before him. If we don't say, God, this is your vineyard. Whatever you want from us, come get it. No, 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 you don't understand. The church is the church. We do things a certain way. You don't understand. We do things a certain way. Um, don't mess with the formula. Jesus did. Jesus did. The formula was pretty awesome. They had this temple. It was cool. It was gold. If we were going to worry about that formula, we wouldn't have green lights in the wall. We have gold up here. Sweet. Bling. They had rituals that they went by that were pretty epic, man. They were like object lessons galore through everything. It was, it was awesome. I mean, I'm, I'm thankful we don't have to, you know, slaughter animals at the altar here. That's good. Um, I think I'd be, on the, I'd be on the floor every week. Like, oh. <laughs> Sight of blood just makes me nervous. Um, but they had a construct for how things ought to be. But they had forgotten why they were in the vineyard in the first place. How about us? How about us? If we reject the stone that becomes the cornerstone, what does that mean? It means we're outside the work of God. He's going to build something, and he's going to use Jesus as the cornerstone of that. If we're outside that, it's going to be built. God's going to build it. It's not going to stop, except we're going to be outside, and in fact, it's going to be the end of us. It just is, folks. So I'd say, let's make him the cornerstone here again. I'm not saying... I, I, I'm saying let's keep him. Let's put it that way. Let's keep him the cornerstone. Let's let him be the vineyard owner, and why don't we just work the vineyard? 
or the fruit that he wants from us, when he wants from us, we just give it to him. How's that? Sound good? Does it sound good? You know what that means, though? <laughs> Here we go. Here's the rub. It means that you're workers, not sitters. I got less amens with that one. Uh, it means that you're workers, not sitters. You know what to happen when they started building churches? They started building churches that were outside of people's homes. And they said, wow, the homes were way more comfortable than the church that we built. We're all standing. Let's put chairs in those buildings. And people started getting comfy. And then we took out pews and we put these things in. You know, pew, ever go to like a, a Puritan church? Have you ever gone to, like, go to, like, Sturbridge Village and sit in the Puritan church? Way uncomfortable. And they had service for, like, nine hours or something like that. It was, you know, crazy. Uh, but they're, like, you're, like, perfectly straight, you know. And then if you messed around in church, they didn't children bulletins, guys. You mess around in church, guess what? The, the, uh, we'll just use Dave. Dave would be the deacon. He would come up with a big, long stick and whack you in the back of the head. Dave, we got that stick, right? Now that the kids are in here, we got the stick, right? I'm sorry, guys. Listen, we can get soft in our comfortable world. One of the things that I loved about yesterday is this. We were created for battle. We were, we're workers. That's what God created us to do. Not sitters, not spectators. You want to see the move of God? You have to do more than watch it. You have to be part of it. It has to start here. And I'm, look it, I'm pointing at me. All right, folks? If we're going to see the move of God, we got to work it, not watch it. All right? So one of the things that we try to do is we're trying to mobilize the church to go outside this year. I pray that every single one of you, whether you're comfortable, I'm not a people person. I don't care. Rake something. All right? I don't care. When, when we do our GC2 project, when we get out into the community, when we're, when we're you know, I don't know what the, what the project's going to be. It's going to be awesome, right, right, right? It's going to be awesome. We're going we're to get teams together from every area of the, the towns that surround our church, and we're going to take a weekend, and we're going to minister to our communities. Don't complain about a lack of revival in the church if you don't show up. I will not listen. Serious? Oh, but, you know, I'm not really healthy. Sit at the booth and hand out lemonade. I don't care. Can you hand out lemonade? You're good. I can't hand out lemonade. I have rheumatoid arthritis in my arms. That's a, tr that's a truth for some people. Then get here, sit, lay, kneel, whatever you got to do, and pray for the groups that are out there. I'm telling you, folks, we cannot be irrelevant. Here's where irrelevance comes in. When we stop being the church, listen, we can bring people in, we can show, we can do light shows and great music. That's great. I love it. I love it, John. <laughs> Trish, I love it. But here's the deal. If people's lives are not being changed, if we're not casting off the yoke of bondage, if we're not setting people free for the power of God's word and the work of the Holy Spirit, then we have become irrelevant to our culture. It's just the way it is. It's not this guy saying it. It's right here. Let's, get, let's, see, let's, let's see what God has to say about what he wants this fruit to look like. I love this. And your healing shall spring up speedily. Too many people will say, I pray for healing and I haven't gotten it. I would like some speedy healing. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, and the speaking of wickedness. I'm not going to comment on every one of these lines, but I hope you understand where I'm going with this. Kind of infer what I'm thinking. That's a scary place. If you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy, satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then, you shall light, then your light shall rise in the darkness, 
and your gloom be as the noonday. Your gloom will be as bright as the noonday. Can you imagine what your excitement will be like? I love it. That's a great one for me. I love that one. Because, I, you know, I, in the past I've struggled with depression, anxiety. I want my anxiety to be like the noonday. And the Lord will guide, your, guide you continually and satisfy your desire in the scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watering ground, like a spring of water, whose water do not fail. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. O Lord, rebuild the ancient ruins. And you shall rise up the foundations of many generations, and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets to dwell in. Now listen, that's all exciting and great. That wasn't written to you. That was written to Israel. Interestingly enough, that was not written to you. That was written to Israel. But let me continue. Matthew 23 says this, O Jerusalem, this happens after the triumphal entry. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers the brood under her wings, and you were not willing. You weren't willing to draw close to me, really. You, you fast, and you sacrifice, and you, and you wear these long tassels, and, and, and you put these things on your arms and on your head, but you weren't really willing to draw near to me. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until, I, until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Back to Matthew 21. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruit. What we read in Isaiah is the fruit of what he wants to have happen in his vineyard. What we're learning today is this. God's got a vineyard. He wants somebody to work it. If so-and-so won't work it, I'll get somebody else to work it. But my fruit is going to happen. My vineyard is going to be prosperous. I am going to win. It's like Trump. Winning. I'm going to win. If you're not going to do my work, I'll get somebody else who will. And he says this. I'm going to give it to somebody else. I'm going to give it to, uh, uh, to somebody who will bear the fruit. And the one who falls on the stone will be broken into pieces, and when it falls on anyone, they will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parable, his allegory, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, see, what, see where this is going? It didn't... It was, it, was con it was condemnation for them. It wasn't conviction. See, what happens is this. When you hear the word of God spoken to you and you get convicted, it makes you go, whoa, I'm off, I'm, I'm off track here. I've gone down a road that, that, that is outside of God's boundaries. So I need to do this really qu crazy thing. I need to repent. Repent means I was going this way, I'm going back. Where did I get off track? Where did I get off? Oh, right here on this burn mark. I got off track here. God wants me to, the Bible, the word of God says, I want to, you want me to go this way, God? I was going that way. You want me to go this way? Here we go. That's called repentance. That's where conviction is. Condemnation says this. What? You want me to go that way? That's ridiculous. Do you know what that way means? It means giving up all that I've worked for. It means giving up my friends. It means I have to uh, live a different way. I'm going this way, and if you, get, if you have a problem with it, I'm going to take you out. That's what the Pharisees did. They heard the word of Jesus, and it was condemnation to them, and they, they, they sought 
to take him out of the picture. Well, the last laugh's on him because next week's Easter. You can try all you want. (laughs) See how that works. While they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. So, my question for you today is this. Are we being good tenants of the vineyard? Do our, does our lifestyle, does our life values, does our way of thinking, does our way of loving match that chapter of Isaiah? Write it down. I want you to read it tonight. I'll get it to you. No. Isaiah 58. Read it again tonight. Read it again tonight. Isaiah 58. If your pencil's not moving, you're not doing what I asked you to do. Isaiah 58. Read it again. If your life is not in keeping with that passage then we are not being the tenants that God has called us to be. And we've just heard what happens to those tenants. I fear that the modern day church in America has really nice walls and some really great watchtowers. You should see these watchtowers, they're awesome. They flash, and they're exciting. But there's nothing being done on the inside. And that is an overgeneralization, I get it. Please understand, there's some churches out there that are doing some great work. I want to be that church. You understand what I'm saying? Let's be that church. Let's be that church. But there's nothing wrong with a little bit of self-evaluation. Take the rubrics of God's word and apply it to your life and find out if you're passing or failing. And if you're not doing well and you find yourself over here, Turn around, go back to the burn spot. Say, God, where do you want me to be? I will go wherever it is. Last verse and we're done. We don't even have a slide for it, so just leave it where it is. John chapter 15. One of my favorite passages in Scripture. One of the most difficult passages in Scripture. First one, I am the vine and you are, and my father is the vine dresser. Very similar terminology, isn't it? He's the landowner. He's the vineyard holder. He's the, he's the one. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. Maybe today is a pruning day. Because all that God wants is more fruit. He wants the most abundant crop he can get out of you. So today, maybe this is a pruning day. This is maybe a pruning hook sermon. All right? And listen, folks, I struggle with this in preparation for this. You get me? Please understand that this guy up here is not a prima donna thinking he's got it all squared away. This type of sermon brings me to my knees because it's hard to present this information without first dealing with it. Okay? And Pete knows. We were sitting yesterday. There were some things that were said yesterday that just hit me right between the eyes. It was awesome, wasn't it? Guys, you're going next year. I don't care if you want to or not. You're going to higher and sharpens iron. All right.
Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me. There we go again, right? What were they willing to do? You're, it's okay, don't worry about it. God loves you anyway. <laughs> Abide in me. What did we say earlier? They weren't willing to embrace Right? They weren't willing to embrace, to get close, to, to, to get intimate with God, to, to be with him. Oh, they kept him here. Those who abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless he abides in me, in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he is that bears much fruit. So, maybe this is a pruning hook sermon, but I'm here to tell you today, you get home, you start thinking about this, and you start saying things like, I'm going to change my ways, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this, I'm going to do that. No, you're not. You're not. So here's the first step. Abide in Get close with him. Get close with him. Find a Bible that you enjoy reading. I mean, there's only one Bible. But I, mean, you know, I, I found Bibles that I just can't read. They're just, there's just too much information. There's too much. Uh, I, I have study Bibles that there's more study information than there is scripture. It's so distracting. You know what I found? I found a Bible that doesn't even have verses, in, verse numbers in it. It just has chapter titles. And I just read it like I would read a book. I can read, I can read large sections of that Bible. It's the same Bible, it's just formatted differently. Find a Bible, I'll, I'll put that, I'll post that on Facebook for you guys so you can see what that Bible is. It's a great Bible. I would encourage you to get, pick one up. It's not even that expensive. Find a Bible that you can read that just takes away the distractions. That you can really get in and like, God, speak to me. I want to be close to you. I want to abide in you. And then through that nourishment of the vine, through that empowering of the stuff he gives, of the Holy Spirit, um, you can. Now you can. But apart from the vine, you're just going to dry up and be thrown into, you'll be good as, as kindling. Get on going? I got to stop. Uh, that cake is going to call my name. Anyway, folks, please understand that I love you. That I'm in the same church with you. But let's, let's, let's worry less about being relevant in the ways that we think we have to be. And let's be relevant in the fact that people are dying without a savior that should be our goal now the other stuff is great we love the other stuff right right we love it it's fun it's good we work hard on it that's why josh has a job anyway uh the, the idea this is why we do this because we we want to we want the best we want excellence in everything we do but folks if it takes the place of god or takes the place of the holy spirit if we shut him out we are going to be replaced by someone who will bear his fruit. Lord, thank you so much for the revelation that you are the king. Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. That's what the angel said when you were born. And on, on Palm Sunday, they, they, they waved palm brands, uh, branches at you. They laid their coats. They heralded you as their king. But some ran and some fought against you. Lord, we are tenants in your vineyard. We acknowledge that it is yours. All we want to do is bear the fruit that you've asked us to bear. We can't do it alone, God. We need the power of your Holy Spirit. So help us to abide in you today. Increasingly, more and more, day after day. Lord, help us to encourage one another. Help these life groups to be a boon to people's uh, 
fruitfulness. And God, I thank you so much for the conviction of your word and the repentance that you allow us to have. Without your sacrifice, there is no repentance that's worth anything. But because of your sacrifice, we can be made right with Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to abide in you and help us to be the church that you've called us to be. Help us to be your people. In Jesus' name. And everybody ready to get off their seats and eat some cake? No, everybody's ready to get off their seats and do some work in the vineyard. If, you don't, if you're not one of those people, just, just don't say amen. But any of those people, just, just give me a good hearty, hearty amen. Have a great week. God bless you.